Hello, hello. Hi, members. Hi. Hi. Um, we are going live for our monthly member call. Um, my name is Dr. Natasha. Hi, and I'm Niaz. I was just about to say we're in August and we're not. We're, this is July's call. <laughs> this is our July, end of the month call. Um, and so every month we have in our Canary Mind Body Club, we do our monthly member call, but we have a portal where we have lots of awesome resources for download, recipes, things like that. And this month we are focusing on Ayurvedic medicine and we're doing a big introduction on it because it's been really amazing to incorporate Ayurvedic practices into my health journey. And I know Niaz also really loves it. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your experience with Ayurvedic medicine. Ayurveda. I don't remember when I first discovered it or when I first rather learned about it, but I was telling someone even just this morning that I have been the same dosha type, which we'll get into later for the past like eight years <laughs> as it changed, which is pretty fascinating because um, when we kind of get into it, it, it all just makes sense just given like the kind of person, person that I am and like what I more or less have contingencies for imbalance versus not. Um, but it's a really incredibly personalized net system of medicine, which is yeah. something that I really love and um, have so much respect for. I think, um, and I know that you can agree here and attest to this too, like medicine at the end of the day, however you define medicine is something that's very personalized and bio-individual and it's not a cut and copy approach. So it's really refreshing to kind of go back to the way that medicine was more or less looked at and um, referred to thousands of years ago in a way that is very natural and bio-individual. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So yeah, so for people who are not familiar with it, um, Ayurvedic medicine is the system of medicine that has been used in India for thousands and thousands of years. Um, I think in Western culture, people may be kind of familiar with Ch traditional Chinese medicine, which is a whole system within itself um, that originated in China, obviously. Um, but really, it's, it's a complete system. So it's not just a therapy or modality. It's an entire mm -hmm. system to look at all aspects of health and the body. And Ayurvedic medicine, which is becoming more and more popular in the West, is um, the traditional medicine from India. And it actually goes really hand in hand with yoga. And it's really interesting because, um, you know, I was uh, learning about yoga from some, um, you know, yoga experts or whatever. And yoga was actually intended to be more of the spiritual side of, mm -hmm. of accessing your spirituality and, um, you know, connecting with source or God or whatever you want to call it. Whereas it's been a little bit um, co-opted in Western culture to be where, you know, yoga is used to like get physically fit or for people's like physical health. But in traditional Ayurvedic medicine, yoga was more of the spiritual mind practice and mm -hmm. Ayurvedic medicine was used to help the physical body. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit what we're going to talk about today and um, how Niaz had mentioned this idea of doshas is a way of looking at every person individually, their constitution, their energy, their mind body um, constitution as well. And um, so, if you know, I think a lot of people have at least once practiced yoga or tried it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the Ayurvedic is the is it goes hand in hand with that. It's like a mm -hmm. sister practice or whatever they go together mm -hmm. in that it helps with digestive imbalances or any sort of physiological or body imbalance so that people can practice deeper, um, sit longer in yoga and connect more with spirit there. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really just the medical system from yeah. India. Um, and so we're going to just do, you know, neither of us are certified Ayurvedic practitioners. We've just had our life changed by a lot of the practitioners. <laughs> so we want to introduce you guys to it. And then in a subsequent month, we hope to bring an Ayurvedic expert into our member group to just do a deep dive with our members. Um, so we'll let, why don't you help us kind of get into this and define yeah. it. What is Ayurveda? Yeah. So like Natasha mentioned, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest form of medicine that's been originated back like 3000 plus years ago in India. It's essentially based on the idea or the thought that disease or dis-ease with a 
dash in between. It's due to it having an imbalance in someone's body or in someone's consciousness. So it incorporates and incorpor it incorporates and it encourages um, lifestyle, you know, therapies and rituals and routines that really help you to refine that balance and that harmony between the mind, the body, and the spirit. Which, being that this is called the Mind Body Club, we thought that it was a very appropriate topic to kind of dive into. Um, the term Ayurveda itself, it's a Sanskrit uh, word, and the meaning of it is essentially knowledge of life. Ayur means life, Veda means science or knowledge, so it's the science or knowledge of life. And again, it's based on that concept of understanding how we are connected to the environment and to the universe itself through these various constitutions, um, otherwise known as doshas. And dosha loosely translates to like our life force um and each person is more or less dominant in one specific dosha versus the other sometimes you can be dominant in more than one um but and you have all you're made up of all the different types of doshas it's more or less just which one is more prevalent in your system or in your body but knowing which dosha you are um will then be able you'll be able to like take the practices or take the knowledge of what that dosha even means and then implement it into your life um whether it be through nutrition or through movement or you know lifestyle practices or mental practices um which is very fascinating too and i do you, what dosha are you i actually don't know what you are well, i'm predominantly vata which as people who will start to learn about this they will see that that's very obvious that i have a lot of vata but i'm a vata pitta um mix um, and we will, before we really get into this, we'll talk about ours in a second, but we're going to have a quiz for all of you guys to figure out what your dosha types yeah. are. Um, and we're going to talk about them. So you can either fill out the quiz or just by listening and watching this, you'll be able to figure out the initial stages of your dosha, your constitution and ways that you can implement lifestyle practices and um, foods and really specific things to your constitution. And that's how we personalize it. Do you, you, you are you... Am I guessing you're mostly Pitta? <laughs> yeah, I'm mostly Pitta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm very fiery. Yeah. <laughs> so we have Mary here who's watching. And we Hi. also we have some people here in the room um, watching. If you guys are watching, you can comment. We have Heather. Heather Hi. says, you ladies are brilliant. I'm so happy to be here. I don't know much about Ayurveda, but I've been wanting to learn. Glad to be learning from the best, you too. Oh, Thank you, oh, Heather. Oh, we are so glad you're here. Um, and if anybody else is watching, you can dive into the comments right now. Um, mm -hmm. Let us know where you're watching from or if you have any questions or comments, we'll try to get to them all. We usually and say- let us know what dosha you are if you do know what you yeah. are. It's fun to kind of get- So we're gonna, <laughs> just since we keep talking about this, we're gonna start talking about these Great. doshas. So um, the three main words that you want to know here is the vata, pitta, and kapha. So those are the three that we're going to talk about. The And um, the energies of people or even foods or activities as well can increase or decrease these different doshas. And um, I love this graphic because it helps us understand the elements or the qualities around those doshas. And when you start to see it that way, because I'm a very visual person, but also kind of tactile and you know, understand and learn things through metaphors, you can think about the elements. And when these elements become unbalanced, it becomes really easy to remember where the diseases or the imbalances come from because the elements are too much or too little. Too little. So for Vata, it's comprised of the elements air and ether. Ether is this element of kind of the space, like not actually the air, but like the space in between, or, you know, I just like to think of it as space. Um, whereas air, you know, maybe wind or air is an element we think of. Um, pizza is comprised mostly of fire, but it's actually a blend of fire and water. Mm -hmm. um, so you'll see those imbalances or that's the way that you kind of bring pizza into balance. And then kapha is the combination of the elements earth and water. Yeah. Um, and it's so kind of fascinating too, because I know we're talking about traditional Indian medicine, but even in Chinese medicine, they talk about the elements too. And they talk about air, fire, earth, water, um, and metal being the other one. And it's so interesting to kind of see how they all just tie together and make sense because mm -hmm. my Chinese element is actually water, which is funny because when I first took the quiz, I was like, why am I not fire? Like if I'm <laughs> Hitta, then I must be a fire element too. Um, but I'm actually water, which for me personally makes a lot of sense because I really love like being in water. I love like the element of water. It does help to cool me down like physically mm -hmm. and also just energetically as well too. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of see you know, on this diagram, how they all kind of intertwine amongst each other. 
Yeah. And again, everybody to some degree is tri doshic, um, but we really have like we have elements of all of these. And also what we'll get into is the different um, foods, the different activities we do, even the different seasons of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, bring up these different elements. So we're all experiencing all of them at some point. But as we'll get into examples um, of ourselves, or Mary here is asking, which one am I? And that's, we're going to be able to figure that out as we go through this. But since you're my mom, and we're very similar, <laughs> I can tell you we're we have very similar doshas. Um, so as we go through these, and we start to I will start um, with the vata, and I'll explain this right. I'm predominantly vata. So this is the element that really is about space and air. Um, and so the qualities around any vata energy are going to be dry, light, cold, rough, subtle, mobile, flexible, and clear. And one way that you can determine a person's dosha, um, and before I say this, and there's quizzes for this, and when you work with a professional or practitioner, they will determine what your inborn like constitution is, meaning this is the dosha you were born with. It's going to mm -hmm. resonate through your whole life. It's usually your body type, your personality type. But then you can have specific imbalances at a certain mm -hmm. time. So even though I may be predominantly vata, I could have a kapha imbalance. And you'll come right. to see what that means when we look at these imbalances. But generally, vatas as a personality type and as a physical build they tend to be thin, kind of wiry, um, quick, changeable mind, vivacious manner. Um, these people strike others as unpredictable and under pressure, they can grow excited and anxious. So um, this is usually, you know, more of like a fast moving or an anxious type of energy. But also with that comes a lot of movement of thought and idea. So Vata is associated with creativity, with a lot of ideas, with art with dance, with movement, that sort of stuff. Um, and so if you are predominantly Vata like myself or for any person, if you do any of these following activities, you will increase or aggravate your Vata dosha. So if you worry, um, if you go really fast, if you don't get enough sleep, if you're eating on the run, you don't have routine, you eat dry food, frozen food, raw food, or leftover food, all of these will increase or aggravate too much dosha. Um, if you run around a lot in this, in not just like running, but if you're actually commuting a lot, if you're on planes a lot, if you're traveling in a car, like if you commute every day and you're a vata person, it becomes incredibly important for you to do grounding practices and slowing practices because movement increases vata. Mm -hmm. Um, if you never lubricate or moisturize your skin, if you work a graveyard shift, so if you're like a night owl, this is going to increase your vata. Um, and if you avoid tranquil, warm, moist places, uh, which I would never avoid, like sitting in a sauna <laughs> or a steam room sounds like heavenly. Um, or if you use stimulants. So I hope nobody's using cocaine or speed, but if you use anything that's like a stimulant coffee, it's going to increase or aggravate vata. Um, and then the diseases associated with it are often neurological as well. Vata is the seat of Vata is in the brain. And so often you'll get anxiety, you'll get insomnia, you'll get um, nightmares, but also pain, spasm, cramps, anything neurological. Um, and then constipation, um, nerve de degener degeneration, indigestion, chills, insomnia, anxiety, depression, like we talked about, and arthritis, stuff like the joints. So if you are, if any of this resonates with you, if you can resonate with being kind of a wiry or active or kind of energetic person with a lot of ideas who moves really fast, talks really fast, the things that will calm that energy down and ground it and balance it with other doshas is staying warm. This is why I'm always wearing fuzzy, warm stuff, which in Niaz is like the opposite of, um, but like wearing socks or just like staying warm, getting lots of sun, staying calm. So not hyping yourself up, eating limited raw foods, which um, may be counterintuitive to some people, but this is where it becomes really personalized. Like knowing mm -hmm. this, say for example, if I was doing uh, an AIP diet or an anti-inflammatory diet and all I was eating was salads all day, I'm going to aggravate my constitution incredibly and I'm not going to heal as well. So if I steamed those vegetables, sauteed them, covered them in oil, it would help a vata predominance. 
Mm -hmm. so not, not eating a lot of raw foods or uncooked foods um, and even cold foods. So you want to eat at room temperature or steamed, um, eating warm foods, eating spices, even like the warmth of spices helps calm Vata. And then keeping a regular routine is super important for Vata because the energy is all the time and everywhere. So the more routine that a person can have, the more grounded they'll be. Uh, meditation, relaxing, relaxing exercises. And then we'll get into the taste um, at the end of this call, but the tastes that help balance Vata are actually sweet, sour, and salty. So if you think about comfort foods too, like in our society, when people get nervous or anxious, they often reach for sweets or salty, sour snacks. Um, that's because their Vata is getting aggravated and those foods calm it. So that is um, the Vata element and we'll move on to Pitta and let Niaz kind of cover this one. Since I know it all so yeah. well. Um, so Pitta, essentially the dominant elements, it sits between fire and water. So if you are also a very like energetic, vivacious, you know, person, it would make sense that fire would be your most dominant element, which is why water helps to kind of cool you down and relax you and ground you. Um, which is why personally, I love to like go swimming or be in the pool or take showers. Um, and really does help to kind of calm my nervous system. But some of the qualities of somebody who would be a pitta would have be really hot, both physically and also personally, like very hot and kind of sharp, um, light, oily, liquid, spreading, sour, acidic, and red. Um, so when you think of heat, when you think of fire, these are the kind of words that would help describe it. And those are essentially what your qualities are. Um, personality, physically, you are a medium sized body. Um, usually you tend to like gain more muscle than you do fat. Um, orderly, very decisive mind, very forceful manner, You're usually very focused um, and pretty like productive and very focused and you know, whatever the task is at hand, um, which comes off for others as being very intense or intimidating, where it's really not, it's just like your personality and how it is. But on pressure, um, pittas tend to be very, um, they lean more towards angry or abrupt or just like irritability, short tempered. Um, I like to think that I'm not really like that. I'm, I'm actually like kind of retreat when I'm under pressure. But you know, again, this is why it's so individualized and why you do kind of carry different characters characteristics across the board. But um, things that really aggravate Pitta are things like drinking plenty of alcohol, smoking cigarettes and marijuana, um, eating spicy foods because that will help to create excess heat, um, engaging in frustrating activities, um, tomatoes, chilies, raw onions, sour foods, yogurt, those are all going to aggravate Pitta as well too. Um, exercising during the hottest time of the day, I can definitely speak to this. I definitely cannot. I have to. I love working out when it's like cold outside or early in the morning because I don't love the heat, um, which is where you and I differ so much. <laughs> um, wearing tight clothing, which personally makes a lot of sense. I love to just wear like either literally nothing at all, or just like very light, loose clothing that like barely touches my body. Um, never fasting or detoxifying the body. You know, we have a huge discussion um, in this space about like intermittent fasting. And while it does have benefits for certain people, depending on where they're at in their body, for some people, it's just not beneficial, especially for long periods of time. And I personally can't fast for longer than like a certain amount of hours, because I tend to then lean towards that phase where I am irritable and anxious and really hot and, bo and bothered. Um, avoiding kind of cool, fresh, peaceful places, which I actually really like cool, fresh, peaceful places. But again, that tends to aggravate Pitta. Um, snacking on really salty foods, repressing your feelings, eating as much red meat and salty fish as possible. Those are all different things that are going to aggravate Pitta. Diseases that tend to be really influenced are things like inflammatory diseases or inflammation, um, which leads to most diseases anyway. So inflammation is like really huge. Um, fever, excess hunger, excess thirst, um, hangry, being really hangry is definitely a personality <laughs> type of pitta. Um, we can't skip meals. It does not sit well with us. Um, heartburn, rashes, acne, early balding or graying hair, which the graying hair I'm definitely experiencing, um, poor eyesight, heart attacks, anger, irritability, impatience, and really overly driven to the point that by overly driven to the point that you experience something that would be like a burnout um, and not really being honored, honoring the pause, honoring the need to rest um, is a definitely personality type of Pitta. So to really help balance Pitta, 
you want to avoid anything that's going to create excess heat, whether that be food nutritionally, or even just like environmentally things that are going to bring up more heat, or even personally things that are going to bring up more agitation and create excess heat inside the body. So you want to focus on foods that are really cooling, um, things like leafy greens, cucumbers, melons, those are all going to help cool the body down as well too. Ideally, nothing ice, just overall ice beverages are not really beneficial anyway, but having drinks that are going to help cool you down, whether that be water or like a light refreshment, um, again, exercising during the coolest part of the day, which I mentioned, spending time in nature, really visualizing, um, being in environments that are going to be really calming and cooling, such as the ocean, um, a rainforest, something that's like damp and wet. Um, and then we're going to talk again about, uh, the taste buds. So things that are sweet, bitter, and astringent are ones that Pitta tend to really fall towards. Yeah. So to kind of recap that the Vata is, you know, on the spectrum of the strengths is really creative and has, you know, lots of energy in that sense, a lot of ideas, but on the flip side can be really anxious and mm -hmm. kind of like, um, wiry and nervous. Yeah. Pitta, you know, can be really driven. They're great mm -hmm. leaders. Um, and, you know, the word I like to think about with Pitta is passion, right? So the fire and like a lot of passion um, and, and like perseverance, getting work done. But on the flip side can be, you know, overworking, um, mm -hmm. you know, being addicted to kind of things that also like make the person feel good, like, like drinking or smoking or those sort of things. So those mm -hmm. are common um, pitfalls for people who are Pitta that they lean towards because it, it kind of helps that dosha. Mm -hmm. But those are things that you want to avoid um, and then overworking and that sort of stuff. And then also like potentially having more frustration or anger from that fiery energy. Yeah. Um, and then when we talk about it from that health setting, Vata is a lot more neurological issues, more um, anxiety, pain in the body, that sort of stuff. Whereas Pitta is more inflammatory. So anything that's red, like rashes or heartburn or like anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and the last one, Kapha. Kapha honestly is uh, a lot less dominant in our culture these days. Um, uh, I've heard from, uh, you know, some masters who I've studied Ayurvedic from, the Ayurvedic medicine from there, it's a lot more of like indigenous qualities, the, mm -hmm. the Kapha energy. Um, whereas, you know, most people in, especially the Western world are, world are a blend of the Vata and Pitta to some degree. Mm -hmm. Kapha tends to be a lot more um, if you think about like indigenous cultures, um, the energy phys physically and kind of mind body energy that they have, that's a lot more of the kapha. It's the earth and water elements. Um, and the qualities of it are heavy, slow, cool, oily, damp, smooth, dense, soft, static, and cloudy. Um, and then there's actually animals associated with each of these. And the kapha, I believe, is the is like an elephant. So if you think about like mm -hmm. a big boned kind of slow, loving, nurturing, slow moving kind of energy, like a slow energy, that's the kapha energy. Um, and often their body types will be heavy set, um, maybe big boned, but they also have a very calm, nurturing energy to them. Um, they have a steady mind. They're not kind of changeable or um, sharp the way that vatas or pittas are in the very easygoing manner. So these people mm -hmm. um, strike others as very relaxed and under, under pressure, they can fall and grow silent. Um, so it's, it's kind of very that like loving, hugging, nurturing energy. Um, but what aggravate, aggravates vata actually, sorry, kapha is doing things that are kind of slow and nurturing, like taking <laughs> long naps, especially after they eat, this will aggravate kapha um, and lead to issues like weight gain and OBC and edema and stuff like that. Um, and also kapha's, and what will aggravate kapha is eating a lot of fatty foods or oils because their energy is already kind of smooth and calm. Um, even overeating is also a problem, denying their creative self, um, kind of like just not moving much, just being inert, um, couch potatoes, those sort of things, <laughs> and assuming someone else will do it. Um, and then if they avoid invigorating warm, dry areas, so cough actually wants to go to more dry areas, they probably do better in the desert, those sort of things than um, somebody who needs more moisture. Um, and it's not great for, yeah, just cough is to just sit still. If they don't exercise, if they live on potato chips and beer, use any sedatives or tranquilizing drugs, if they repress their feelings, eat desserts, 
every day, those sort of things will really bog down the kapha energy. And the diseases associated with this are congestion, mucus buildup. So anything that like you think about earth and water combining and you get this kind of sludgy uh, material. So think about that compared to the fire, which is inflammation and rashes or air, which is like nervous energy, um, like the, the nervous system. Uh, if you think about kapha, you get sludginess. So you get congestion, you get mucus, blockages, heaviness, fluid retention, edema, lethargy, um, obesity, chest colds, um, kidney, gallstones, asthma, depression, diabetes, and high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. so those are all kapha imbalances. And in order to balance that, getting plenty of movement and exercise, avoiding those heavy foods, staying active, um, varying the routine. So this is the opposite of what vatas want to do. Kaphas actually want variety. Um, they want to avoid dairy and avoid iced foods and drinks, fatty foods, eat really light dry foods. Um, so I think your, uh, wasn't popcorn the snack we had for kaphas? Um, actually kind of having that light airy, whereas like a vata should not be eating popcorn. Um, not good for your digestion, not good for your mind. And then the, the taste, the dominant taste for balancing kapha are bitter, astringent, and pungent taste. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of a summary of the three doshas. And of course, everyone's a blend of these, right? Okay. Um, do you have any stories or tidbits you want to add about these, Niaz, before we move on to... I mean, I think what's interesting about you know, doshas or constitutions is that, again, we're made up of all three of them. It mm -hmm. just depends on which one is the most dominant in your body at the moment and so yeah. retaking the test every like maybe every few years you know and maybe every time like a, something um substantial kind of happens in your life whether you like started working with like a doctor and you kind of cleared things out or whether you um started like working more on your mental health and like you know clearing all of that out more or less mentally and kind of working through those you know sticky areas and then retaking this assessment just to see maybe if your constitution has changed and you're more this versus that. Um, yeah. but like I mentioned in the beginning, I've taken this quiz at least every other year for the past like decade and I'm consistently Pitta. Yeah. Um, which is so, I think the very last time I took it though, I was, I had a bit more percentage on Kapha than I did on Pitta. Um, mm -hmm. or not Kapha, not Kapha, um, Vata, which I did on Pitta, which was interesting, but predominantly I've always been, um, a pitta, it just hasn't, hasn't bunched, which is fine. I, it, I, I've accepted that I'm like fiery horse, you know, astro astrologically and also fire. <laughs> 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 yeah. And we actually have two quizzes in the member portal. One of them yeah. is about your it, it, like innate constitution and one is about mm -hmm. your current imbalance. So, um, it really depends on kind of what is going on with your body and your mind at the time, but also what's going on with the earth and seasonally and stuff like that too, which I had mentioned. So this chart is really awesome because it lets us see that as well in this system, you know, like normally we say, okay, there's four seasons, but really if we look at it from these energies, there are predominant Vata energies in the earth and the seasons in late fall, early winter. Mm. And obviously I mean, right now I'm going to just be referring to like the Northern hemisphere. So like when we get, when it starts getting cooler and it's, um, you know, the winter starts coming, that's a lot of where the Vata energy is. And you think about it, it's dry, it's cold. Um, there's a lot of like light, um, windy energy around that time. Mm -hmm. And then Kapha energy is really late winter, early spring. So like the coldest time of the year in, um, you know, in our seasons, we think about where it's like snowing, or it's just kind of wetter. Like if, I mean, it's droughted right now here on the West Coast, but it used to be the rainy season, even though it wouldn't snow, it was the Kapha rainy season. So the earth and the water would mix. Um, and then Pitta was the summertime, right? So when it gets hot, and what's really fascinating about this is that everybody's doshas are going to vary as you're in a different environment or a different season. So if you, you know, travel and you're in a different region that has a different climate, different temperatures, different humidity than you're used to, it's going to start affecting your dosha balances as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's great to think about this too, as the seasons go. And this is why often, um, you know, people during this like Vata period, or it's like late fall, early winter, 
they start talking about eating a lot of root vegetables and soups and like butternut squash soup and those sort of things because that's a recipe that is really calming and soothing for a vata energy. Um, and so somebody like myself who carries vata energy throughout the year, I might be having some butternut squash soup like on a summer's day because I'm super aggravated. But in general, everybody's going to have increased vata energy mm -hmm. during that season. So it's generally good. And then when you get to like pizza time, for example, eating like cold raw watermelon, for example, is a great cooling mm -hmm. food. Um, and that's something that in general, everyone tolerates better in the summer because everyone's pizza energy is increased from the summertime. Yeah, totally. Wow, yeah. I'm craving that. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good for the pitta because it helps to cool me down. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so let me see if I have, I think I have, I have so many like resources here that I've just collected mm -hmm. over the years, but we can look at kind of these, these foods as well. Um, and when we look at it like a food pyramid, um, and we can see that those sweet food, it's also referring to like carbohydrates, mm -hmm. um, or even legumes, um, these, you know, sort of, those are all the sweet flavors. Um, and that's why people who are predominantly Vata or have a Vata imbalance, meaning anxiety, depression, nervousness, um, you know, restless mind, insomnia, they will yeah. often reach for sweets because sweets calm Vata down. But you want to start thinking about too, if you're autoimmune, if you have Hashimoto's, you have Graves, mm -hmm. you have um, any autoimmunity, any uh, like imbalances in your physiology, you don't want to be eating lots of bread or necessarily lots of grains, for example, but you can look for other fruits, for example, or, um, you know, other meats that have a sweet element to them to calm that energy down rather than going for like the cheap fuel that will make right. you feel better in that time period. Um, yeah. I mean, do you eat a lot of foods? I, I that's the other thing I love when I was introduced to this is that really all I used to eat was like sweet and salty and maybe sour on occasion. And the ideas of stringent, bitter and pungent were just not part of my yeah. standard American diet vocabulary because um, I mean, I'm sure just growing up in a Persian household, I was, you know, my mom cooked with a lot of these spices or whatnot, but totally. Um, yeah. Do you like, do you like I, things? Or? I gravitate towards sweet and towards, um, I do like sour, um, but I usually like sweet and I like bitter. So I mm -hmm. love like radishes. Um, I love cucumbers that are like definitely like cooling. I love like, I have a huge like sweet tooth for like, not necessarily like cake or, you know, cupcakes or cookies, but like bread. Um, yeah. Carbs and, and stuff. Uh, yes, totally. But yeah, I, I love the sweets. I love the bitter. I, I don't love, I like spicy, but like, not too much spicy and I don't love yeah. salty, um, which is interesting. Here you go. You just it <laughs> I don't love salty. I also just like personally yeah. don't metabolize salt very well. Like my genome, just like I have a mutation against like salty foods anyway. Yeah. So that personally makes the most sense for me, but um, I can see why it would make sense generally for Pitta here. Yeah. So we have, um, you know, the sweet foods here. Um, examples of that, you know, like we talked about are the grains, the starchy vegetables. Um, but what's really interesting too is in Ayurvedic medicine, they also qualify different types of meat as sweet. Um, and so, yeah, just if you take a look at this chart, give me one second here. I'm going to, I'm going to pause. I mean, I'm going to, my printer's going off. So I'm just going to turn that off and you can look at this chart. I'll be right back. <laughs> what are you printing that your printer is going off of? Um, Interesting though. Sweet, sour, vata, salty, pungent, pitta. So personally, favor sweet, bitter, astringent tastes, reducing, yeah, again, reducing hot and spicy foods. Like I mentioned, I don't, yeah. I don't love, it's not the first thing that I would pick on the menu. Um, yeah. But if I have it, I'll have it. But I notice personally, like if I have something that's like very spicy, I tend to then be really like irritable and I'm consistently sweating and perspiring. Like it's just, it's yeah. Like, yeah. And what's really cool about Ayurvedic medicine is, you know, a lot of the prescription around how to balance your health and yeah. like chronic illnesses and diseases is actually food based. So they prescribe right. based on dosha, really specific diets or foods that are not these general like, you know, um, AIP diet or whatever, because that mm -hmm. is 
you know, large food groups. And this is where I really love bringing in Ayurvedic principles in mm -hmm. working with people, especially people who are doing like the autoimmune paleo diet yeah. um, or those sort of things. Because like I said, I could be, for example, doing the autoimmune diet and avoiding nightshades, avoiding seeds and all mm -hmm. of that sort of stuff, but eating raw veggie greens all day and just yeah. feeling terrible, like being yeah. bloated and anxious and not digesting well. So just bringing in a simple principle about being predominantly vata, having anxiety, that sort of stuff, I would recommend to a client or for myself, okay, if you want to do the AIP elimination, great. We know you have autoimmunity. We need to reduce inflammation. But what I'm going to ask you to do is to steam all your food or lightly saute mm -hmm. it. Or if you're going to eat a salad, cover it in lots of oil. So you get yeah. more of that you know, warm, oily quality instead of mm -hmm. the dry, cold vata quality. Because if you're already suffering from anxiety and that sort of energy, you could be following all the rules of the mm -hmm. AIP diet, for example, or gluten-free, dairy-free, whatever it is, but the quality and the temperament of the food that you're eating is actually aggravating what you're putting into your body energetically as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why I really, really love bringing this principle in and mixing it with Eastern and Western medicine. Um, but what I also thought was so interesting is like I said, you know, standard American diet really, really got the sweet, salty, sour down. Like we know what those <laughs> foods are, right? <laughs> Most people eat those, but then when it gets too pungent, I think, you know, there's definitely chilies and that sort of stuff that people eat, yeah. but often it's like in salsa, right? Or it's in, it's in, you know, not a standard American diet. Um, and I know that Persian food will start almost every dish with sauteed onions and turmeric, right? And that's mm -hmm. a very pungent flavor. Yeah. Um, or garlic is in every meal that you cook, like yeah. in Persian food. Um, but I know a lot of maybe Americans don't really know how to cook garlic or onions um, in their mm -hmm. meals or food properly, or how to add ginger or add mustard to your food. Mm -hmm. So these pungent flavors, we have to think a little bit more about incorporating all of these tastes because they all have different medicinal values. Um, right. Bitter, I know this is, you know, a lot more popular now for people to be like leafy greens, leafy greens, right? But that's where we get that bitter flavor from those kale has become really popular or sprouts or, you know, these types yeah. of bitter flavors. Um, you and I are used to that because in Persian culture, we eat something called sabzi then, like during the meal, which is essentially just like a mixture of different herbs like you know um, marjoram and basil and mint and parsley and you just like take a whole like handful of it and you eat and it's very bitter and then when you eat that with like raw radish and sometimes even raw onion if you're really yeah. feeling down for it um, and all of that is very bitter but that helps to kind of turn on these digestive fires and um, help with digestion overall depending on the, whatever the meal that you're going to eat which Persian yeah. food tends to be very heavy to begin with so it helps to kind of break things down but yeah, I love the the raw onion thing. Um, my husband is American born Chinese, but he loves having Persian food too. And he's learned that like, you have to have the sumac on the table with the <laughs> lemon to squeeze on the food with yes. the raw onion with all the greens. Gosh. And you mix these flavors together. And that's why traditional diets were so powerful in terms of medicine and healing. Yeah. It's not because they were restrictive. It's because they were balanced. And because, right. um, you know, they, even if something was inflammatory, there was a lot mm -hmm. of these other flavors and tastes like if we looked at this pyramid again we want to bring in these other flavors and tastes yeah. to balance out the sweets which is predominantly sweet salty in our meals um and then finally astringent um this is also not very common in a lot mm -hmm. of meals or foods that we eat in the west um i adore pomegranates so, so yeah. i i get lots of astringent from pomegranates but like tea or green teas um they also have that astringent quality that kind of makes your mouth pucker a little bit. Um, but like the skins of grapes are astringent or, um, you know, beans, these sort of things. So these are things that will help kind of balance the different energies in our body. And it's really never good to, you know, be really excessive with any one thing. So even if you are predominantly vata or predominantly pizza or kapha, um, it doesn't mean you should never eat these other types of food, but you should favor, as it says, mm -hmm. favor the pungent, bitter, astringent, or favor the sweet, bitter, astringents, um, and then avoid the other ones because they will increase or aggravate your dosha. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, there's a lot to learn here. These are the quizzes that we have in the member portal. So if you are not a member, click on the link in the comments and join us in our membership because we have lots of fun resources. We have a mini guide that's going up there soon. Um, but this, the first quiz is the constitution quiz. So this is about mm -hmm. what you were born with, what you will live with, with the rest of your life. Like this is your constitution. So you take this quiz and you add it up. And I love it because this has, if you look up here, a body constitution, okay. but then if you go down, it has the mind constitution as well. So it has your mind body, um, constitution. And then this is your current imbalanced state. Um, so even like you were saying, if you're predominantly Pitta all the time, if you take this quiz, you might find, oh my gosh, I actually have a lot of a cough. I'm gonna, I'm gonna retake it. Yeah. I don't, you never know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so there's that. There's the there's the body, the digestion, the mind and emotions. And you could have like a vata imbalance in say your mind and emotions, but mm -hmm. have maybe a kapha imbalance in your body. And then yeah. with that, you know, there are lots of resources and we're going to put some book recommendations and activity recommendations up in the member portal. Um, but I have a lot of, I have a lot of Ayurvedic books. Um, so I have these textbooks here. These are textbooks written by Dr. I believe he goes by Dr. He's Vasant Laud. He is, oh, let's do this little picture here. He is the father of Ayurvedic medicine in the Western world. Look at him. He, yeah, Thank he you um, teaches in New Mexico, I believe, but he teaches at the college there for Ayurveda. Um, and anyways, in these textbooks, but also a lot of other books you can get, you don't have to get the textbooks. We're gonna give you easier books, but they have these charts here of like categories of food. And then if you should avoid or increase per. So Great. to give you guys an example of where this is really fascinating, um, for a vata type, for example, if you take this and you have a vata imbalance on the quiz, um, I'm going to just talk about some of these foods here. It, say you're eating animal protein. Um, if you have a vata imbalance, you want to avoid white chicken, but you want to eat dark meat chicken because it's warm ah. and it's calming. You want to avoid lamb, pork, rabbit, venison, and white turkey, but you want to eat beef, dark meat, chicken, eggs, fish, shrimp, and dark turkey. So- Absolutely. Yeah. So even just within the category of animal proteins, if you have a specific imbalance, um, it goes the other way. And then what's fascinating is if you look at Pitta, if you have a Pitta imbalance, it's the absolute flip of that. So a Pitta should not be eating the dark meats. They shouldn't be eating dark meat chicken, the dark meat turkey. They should avoid beef. But the Pitta should favor, if you have a Pitta imbalance, you should favor white meat chicken, egg whites, freshwater fish, not saltwater fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. white turkey shrimp rabbit and venison not yeah. beef not lamb so this, i love lamb too <laughs> <laughs> and it's and that's the thing that's lovely about this is if you eat lamb that's fine you just have to understand that the energy qualities right. of it are that and you need to balance it by eating a lot of like exactly. cucumbers or pizza calming foods with it exactly so um that's why traditional dishes often have a, such a complex blend of spices or vegetables or, yeah. you know, side dishes, um, chutneys or pickled right. food, like porsche, right? Because they will come in and bring in the pungent or the stringent flavors and balance out a meal rather than like looking at it so um, compartmentalized. Like yeah, that. exactly. So thing. it's not a one size fits all. It's a what fits for you. So. Yeah, exactly. Um, do you have any any practices you love with uh, Ayurvedic with practices? Yeah. I love tongue scraping. I do that every time I brush my teeth, which is every night. <laughs> or every morning, but I don't really tongue scrape in the morning. Um, that's probably like one of my favorites that I've incorporated as far as like Ayurvedic. Of course, yoga. Um, mm. Waking up. I like to wake up like with the sun and I like to start resting when the sun goes down. Yeah. So that's a practice of Ayurveda too. Um, and then because, you know, I grew up on having so many different spices, I love to cook with spices and explore spices. And like, you know, I love like putting like sumac on my avocado toast. It's like <laughs> so good. Um, which like for anyone who's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, I, I really love like incorporating different variety of spices into my foods too at every meal, you know, not, doesn't have to be just dinner because that's like the heaviest or lunch because it's the heaviest but like even breakfast even snacks i like to incorporate like different spices or herbs into my snacks too so yeah 
whether that's Ayurvedic or not, because I think that's more or less cultural. Mm -hmm. um, some practices that I like to definitely use. Yeah. Yeah. And for people who have never tried it, sumac or somal, as we call it in right. Persian, Farsi, um, it's a actually a very sour. It's one of the only sour mm -hmm. spices. It's like a sour berry. Um, yeah. and it's delicious. And it's they usually put it on beef kebab or yeah. um, meat kebab. Um, yeah. And what you had mentioned a couple of, we talked a lot about food, but there are a lot of lifestyle practices. Like, like yeah. you said, rising with the sun, sleeping with the sun is super mm -hmm. important. Um, because the energies throughout, not just seasons, let me show you this chart. The energies throughout the day also change. There you so, go. Oh, lost it. Sorry guys. Here we go. There we go. So if we look at this, um, and if any of you guys are familiar with like the, um, Chinese medicine also has a similar clock. But mm -hmm. if you look at the 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. is kapha energy. And so it has to do with um, stimulating and producing like enzymes and fluids and stuff in our body. So generally, it's best to wake around that time. Then 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. is about transforming life. So mm -hmm. that's the best time to, I think, kind of do some of your activities in the morning. Um, that pits mm -hmm. energy, that intensity, that focus that you can have. And then the Vata energy from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. is really should be this winding down time, a creative relaxation, um, kind of wrapping up work and, and getting back to some me time. 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. is about connection and love. And that goes back to that Kapha energy, like we talked about, the nurturing, right. the kind of domestic home life. Um, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. is transform and detoxify. So for those night owls out there, um, this is, again, both in Chinese medicine clock and in Ayurvedic, getting to bed by like 10 p.m. so that your body can rest and start to go through detoxing your brain, detoxing your liver, your kidneys, your lungs is super important because if you're not mm -hmm. sleeping during that 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. period, you are blocking your body from transforming, doing that biotransformation and that detoxification. And I'm then we get back this knowing you and like in the 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. is you're such a night owl. I know. And like <laughs> it's yeah, like really funny. Energy. and this becomes the thing is like being super aware of this because if you are like I have you know been a creative person all my life when I start mm -hmm. painting it's like those are the hours where I get the most done but it's also because people want that quiet like time to themselves and that mm -hmm. 2 a.m to 6 a.m kicks in that vata energy again so um, having that pitta drive and that vata if you flipped your clock around it's because you're tapping into these energies, but it in the long run ends up causing a lot of chronic health issues and imbalances. Right. Um, so from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., it's about breathing, centering, releasing. So those are the best times to be asleep um, according to this. So yeah, we have these like awesome resources available that I've collected over the years from so many different courses and um, places that we've learned this from, but just activities that you can do. And what I love about this too, mm -hmm is that, you know, we have these systems of like waking and sleeping and eating at certain times, but to personalize it for constitutions, um, matzos, for example, want to eat smaller meals um, so that they're a little bit hungry between the meals. They want to have breakfast from eight to nine. So whereas a pitta wants to have breakfast earlier, 7.30 to 8.30, um, and then the kaffas actually have a much later breakfast from nine to 10. So it's best for a kaffa to actually wake up, do some movement, activity, exercise, and then eat later. Um, and it's just really interesting to look at these individualizations of these daily activities, um, even though we're all kind of following the earth's clock with that energy. Right. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of mind body practices that can be personalized with this. Um, and we have a lot of that stuff in our member portal. Um, and, you know, there's other Ayurvedic practices that are just, you know, this one's a really popular one. It's, it's gained a lot of popularity, the alternate nostril bre breathing. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a great one for you guys to try. And um, tongue scraping, which Niaz talked about. Um, and I, in our resource thing, I actually have... Uh, really fascinating. I, I don't, uh, Vasant Lod, he wrote a daily yeah. practice thing. And for the tongue scraping, using different metals and materials are actually uh -huh. best for each. So Vata is actually best to use a gold tongue scraper. I don't know where you're going to find a gold oh, tongue okay. scraper. <laughs> but energetically, 
Gold um, has the most healing properties for vata imbalances. Pizza types should use a silver one. So again, you you need to invest in a silver tongue spray. I use copper, so that's interesting. Okay. Kapha, kapha should be using copper. Interesting. And the tridoshic one is actually stainless steel. So for the cost effective one, before you invest in your gold or your silver. Yeah, that is tongue why. Scraper. Let me um, know if you find a gold tongue scraper. I'm <laughs> fascinated by this. <laughs> um, but stainless steel is a great one for everyone. And the other practice that I absolutely love, I talk to a lot of my clients about, is body massage, self-massage, particularly belly massage. Yeah. And we'll blend this with a little bit of Western medicine where belly massage activates the vagus nerve. And if mm -hmm. you guys don't know about that, we'll talk about that a whole nother month. We'll do brain health another month. There you go. Um, but... Belly massage is a really great way, but even just like full body massage or doing lymphatic drainage, like we've talked about on other sessions, yeah. but switching up the oil that you use for your dosha or body type can make such a huge difference. So for um, kaphas, I actually don't know where you would get mustard oil, but they recommend mustard oil or sunflower oil for kapha types. Okay. Pitta types recommend, and this is actually topically like skin. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. For pizza, it's sunflower or coconut oil, um, which is a very popular one. And for vata, you want to use sesame oil. Um, and I would recommend the non-toasted kind because I know toasted sesame oil is used for cooking and it's got a lot of flavor. Um, but there is non-toasted. And ideally, when you get any oil, anything you're putting on your skin, you want it to be edible. You want it to be mm -hmm. um, organic, highest quality because it's getting absorbed, but, um, do you use any of those oils on your skin or, I mean, there's a lot of other oils, but yeah, I use, um, I use argon. I use apricot seed. I use, um, castor on my head, mm -hmm. um, for my hair. I'll yeah. For hair. Um, what's the other one? Um, avocado, almonds. I'm allergic to coconut, so I can't. Use oh, coconut. right, right, right. Um, That's true. And sesame and, uh, mustard. Have you ever tried uh, the sunflower oil? No, not on my body. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when my husband and I would go get couples massage, we get a lot of body work. We would just take like, we'd go to Trader Joe's and pick up a jar of coconut oil, keep it in our car and take it. Cause we're like, we don't know what oil they're using at those, you know, any salon or whatever, even if it's got synthetic perfumes in it, we don't want to have that on our skin. Yeah. So we take coconut oil and um, he always loved it. He's by the way, very pitta. So he oh, loved okay. it. And I have to say, I, I didn't love it, but I was like, well, it's cleaner, it's healthier. And when I learned about the sesame oil, I took a little jar of organic sesame oil in glass um, and asked my uh, massage therapist to use it instead and in coconut for him. And it was like, honestly, it felt life changing. Like my skin just sucked it up and just absorbed it. I felt so moisturized after, um, which was just strange for me to think about rubbing sesame oil all over my body. But being, yeah, being these different body types, um, it may seem, seem strange, but there's lots of different oils you can use. Um, you can use them in, um, not colonics, uh, enemas. That's the word I'm thinking of. <laughs> you can actually do oil enemas. They recommend that over water because you want to lubricate your gut. Right. right. Yeah. Don't do um, oils colonic. <laughs> yeah. I think I, these are some practice, like in really advanced practices in Arabic medicine that I haven't tried, but like lubricating your nose like kind of like right the i don't know if you snort it or you just like pour just oil like, i just like take the oil and just like go like this far up my nose and just inside yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Inside my nose. i'm not gonna pick my nose here but yeah yeah <laughs> um but that's actually you know some of those morning practices is tongue scraping putting oil right. in your nose massaging your body but um customizing it with these specific oils for your different mm -hmm. body types um, mm -hmm. actually can make a huge difference. And like the exercises, for example, you know, it recommends that kaphas do like really vigorous, like probably a vinyasa flow or something like something right. very vigorous. Right. Whereas vatas on the other end of the spectrum are recommended to do more yin yoga and more yeah. of the restorative um, pitch is probably right in the middle there. <laughs> yeah. We like hatha, which is like, it's intense, but it's slow, which gets us out of our head and more mm -hmm. into our body. Um, yeah, so it varies, but yeah. there's so much to unpack with Ayurvedic medicine. Like we could talk for days about it. So we'll have to definitely like do a deep dive one month. Um, yeah, but it's really fascinating because it's been around for thousands and thousands of years and it has, yeah. you know, these traditional medicine have a slightly different perspective on our mm -hmm. health 
our mind, our body, our diseases, all of those, why they develop, how to treat them and reverse them. So if you've never explored this, these are, you know, download the mini guide, just try the practices that we have for you and see if you notice any difference, like the, the circadian rhythm timing or the different massage oils or the tongue scraping. Um, see if you notice any difference with these. And if you do, I really encourage you to find an Ayurvedic practitioner near where you live and um, blend that with the, you know, like an integrative approach with what you're already doing for your thyroid or your autoimmune or chronic fatigue or whatever it is that you're struggling with. And let us know, let us know what changes you do and how you feel. Yeah. Um, I don't see any questions. If any, I know some people are still live here. We see them on, but if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in or comments or any insights you had. Um, but Niaz and I are going to be finishing up our mini guide. So if you're not um, a member and you're previewing this video, definitely sign up for that. Download the mini guides. I know that's one of our um, member favorites. We yes. get emails and private, we get DMs messages about those mini guides just being the favorite part of the membership. It's um, my favorite part too. Well, aside from connecting with all of you, but it's my favorite thing to give all of you. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I think it's, you know, yeah. I, I grew up reading a lot of spark notes in high school or. Oh, or yeah. Cliff notes, or spark notes. How do you think I passed any of my English classes? <laughs> yeah. Essentially what we're doing. We're creating <laughs> personalized, holistic mind body cliff notes or spark notes. Amazing. For you guys. That could be a good business stream there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what our mini guides are. And if you join now, you have access to the previous three months of mini right. guides. So you missed last month or the months before you can watch all the videos, download all the mini guides and the recipes. Mm -hmm. Niaz has provided us with, um, Snack with recipes. Yeah. yeah. So get in there. Enjoy. I sort of, I gave a little spoiler there. If you're a Vata, don't be making popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Heather, <laughs> mini guide is gold. How do we find an Ayurvedic practitioner? Yeah, Heather. Um, so we will put that in the mini guide. Um, uh, I think there are some directories, but there are there are a couple of Ayurvedic schools in the United States that mm -hmm. teach like certified um, Ayurvedic practitioners. I know of a couple. I have friends and colleagues who graduated mm -hmm. from some in California, New Mexico. So yeah. we'll put some resources in there for you guys to find practitioners. Um, the other thing that we're also going to put in the mini guide that I would recommend is um, looking up the books that we recommend. So this is a really mm -hmm. awesome one that I have, The Complete Book of Ayurvedic Home Remedies. There you go. Um, also written by the man, Vasant Lad here. <laughs> he is the, the father of Ayurvedic medicine. Um, he has a lot of really, really great books. Um, so you could look up his stuff, but like this book has all these amazing charts in it. If you can see oh. Um, it has, you saw the nostril breathing. It has just like a lot of home remedies and mind body practices. So this is a great one. Um, if you're really into spices and herbs, I recommend, um, a book called the yoga of herbs. We'll put that in the mini guide as well. Um, I think it literally like you just look up the reference of like basil and it describes the properties of basil, and the, you know, the right. qualities of that. Um, and then, yeah, you can find practitioners through that, through the schools, through these books, like home studies, actually really effective. If you want to do that before you work with a practitioner to, to just try out some of these practices. Um, and then I actually, I have to plug in this one too. The Paleo Vedic Diet, um, Dr. Akil, he, I, and I will um, disclose that I'm actually working with him right now as a patient, um, right. even though I've done a lot of my own um, autoimmune healing and management, you know, and my husband has helped me a lot. I was just like, it's always great to have a practitioner in your oh, corner. Cool. So I am lucky enough that he's in my town right now. Oh, fun. He um, is a medical doctor who studied functional medicine and has a background in Ayurvedic, but he has a whole book called the Paleo Vedic Diet. Um, and he kind of describes this. It's a really great blend of functional medicine mm -hmm. and Ayurvedic. So, um, yeah, check that out too. Um, but all those resources will be in the mini guide for you, Heather, um, and our mm -hmm. other awesome members who are watching on replay. I know you guys send us private messages all the time, so I don't want to call out your names here, but um, you know who you are. We appreciate you guys so much. Um, and we have a really big announcement for the club coming next month, hopefully. So stay tuned. Um, things are going to expand and grow, and you're going to have access to 
a lot more goodies, um, but we will unveil that as the time comes. So stay tuned for that. Yay. Amazing. Um, and we'll see you all next month in August. Yeah. And I think this past month we got a bunch of new members in. Yeah. We got a lot of new members, so we want to welcome you guys with open arms, a big hug from us. Um, <laughs> we love having you here. And um, if you're watching the replay on this or exploring the portal right now, um, just shoot us a message. Say hi. And we can't wait to see you guys all next month. Yay. All right, everyone. Take care. Bye, Bye. Heather. <laughs>